Who are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? I'm trying to get on this lifestyle radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's all right. Oh. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. The opinions expressed during this show are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their associated organizations or Lifestyle Radio. So what are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? I'm trying to get on this Lifestyle Radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's all right. Oh. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. The opinions expressed during this show are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their associated organizations or Lifestyle Radio. Welcome to Cannabis and Coffee with me, Tamara Wana. It's a beautiful day in these kootenays. Blue skies are poking through. We're now at one week of legalization to the day, and the sky has not fallen. Woohoo! I know we've seen a few, you know, people that have gotten ticketed here and there, but, you know, in reality, on the bright side of that, that person would have had a criminal record the week before. And, I mean, I'm not, you know, highlighting the, the positives on this by any stretch, but that is a positive. The teenagers, you know, would have been having to go through alternative measures in Alberta. I don't know what the, you know, system is here so much in British Columbia. I haven't been involved in the judicial system here, thankfully, too much. But uh, in Alberta, they would be going through to, um, alternative measures, which then gives them into rehab, which then gives the government stats on marijuana addiction. So, you know, this is how this is kind of rolled out as to save the children because of these silly alternative measure programs, I think, that they've got going on with trying to get these kids not having criminal records with the prior regime. This morning, I have an uh, activist that has been working towards this and many other things for over a decade. Matt Elrod has been involved on the island in the latest uh, bylaw battle between, um, actually, well, I guess it's not really between him and anybody. It's the, the little town decided they weren't going to allow the four-plant grow. So good morning, Matt. How are you? I'm good, Tamara. How are you? I'm, you know, hanging in there as best I can, right? So I usually ask my guests who, what, where, when, and why. So I'm going to start out with who you are and how and why you got involved with cannabis to begin with. Okay, well, that's a long story. And in fact, it, I'm not counting, but I've been involved well over two decades. Excellent. Um, I got, yeah, I got involved in cannabis activism in the mid-90s. Um, I was working from home on a computer, and with the dawn of the Internet, uh, I started to sort of browse around, and um, I'd always had an interest in drug policy. I I guess I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn to say I tried cannabis at a, in my mid-teens, you know, the average age of initiation in Canada is 14, and I was maybe a little younger than that. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I, you know, I'd been around cannabis all my life, all my adult life. But in the mid-'90s, I took an interest in what might be going on around the world in, in cannabis activism and um, got on the Internet. And back in those old days, uh, cannabis activists communicated with mailing lists and listservs and things of that nature. And so I got involved in the American listservs and the American activism community, Normal Drug Policy Alliance, then known as the Drug Policy Foundation. Um, and uh, one project of uh, a group called the Drug Reform Coordination Network, which was, they called it the Media Awareness Project. And the idea was to make the media aware that there was a lot of good research on cannabis, a lot of government commission studies like the Ladane Commission and the Schaefer Commission and the LaGuardia Report, and that there was no need for the press to be so ignorant on the subject. And uh, our idea was to spread news kind of the way we do in social media today, you know, and what's going on in drug policy in the U.S. and Canada, and to get activists to write letters to the editor pointing out this research which we'd put online 
on a, a website called Drug Policy, or sorry, DrugLibrary.org, and uh, it kind of snowballed. I, I I was actually rejected by the Americans at first because, you know, there are a lot of people who've been working on this since the 70s, and uh, getting into any activism, you tend to run into the old veterans who turn up their noses at newcomers. And being a sensitive Canadian, I was a little hurt by that. And I thought, well, I'll turn my attention to Canada. And I founded the Canadian Media Awareness Project and started up a listserv and reached out to other activists in Canada. There wasn't much going on in those days. There was normal Canada, but they were pretty um, laid back. (laughs) And there there was a Canadian Foundation for Drug Policy, Eugene Oscapella's group. But they were mostly ivory tower academics and when i reached out to them to start a listserv they weren't too impressed with the idea so i just sort of headed out on my own and recruited activists from across canada and before you knew it we had a great website and then the americans took notice of that and said oh hey how would you like to work on our website and i did that and um, then the next thing you know all sorts of american activist groups wanted to get online, wanted to get websites, and I sort of had a first starter advantage there. So um, long story short, before long, I was looking after over 100 drug policy organizations in North America online um, in Canada That's incredible. And, and the States. And uh, we hired on more webmasters. One you might know, Deborah Harper. I do. A, pi- a pioneer out of Alberta. Absolutely, li- she is. And she lived here for a while. So she became my co-webmaster, and along with some other people, and um, yeah, at its peak, it was it was one of the most popular drug policy-related websites online. We put all those news articles that we newshawk that we found into a big archive. Um, I'm a librarian by day, so I organized them so that you could search them three ways from Sunday, and and uh, it became kind of a go-to place for your drug policy news. It's since been kind of superseded by social media, but. In its day, it was quite a powerful tool, and, and it now serves as sort of a, a record of of how drug policy evolved over the last uh, 20, almost 30 years. Right, and it's quite an, it was quite an honor to be, like, to get on Deb Harper's list, like we were saying before, because Deb is, you know, a huge pioneer in, in cannabis activism. Um, you have to be nominated. So to get on our, you know, cannabis Canadian coalition list, it was you have to be nominated by other activists and, you know, kind of like have backing to who you are and what you've done. And to be on that, it's quite an honor. I know I was allowed to be put on it about 10 years ago. So it hasn't been as active in the last probably three years as it was when I first got involved with it. But boy, there's so much information you can just go back and archive through in that, that we've got you know, multitudes of different conversations between all of us for so many different things. That really was a catalyst towards where we are now, too. Yeah, well, you know, get it, it's empowering to know that there are other people out there like you, <laughs> for one thing. Um, <laughs> and you're, you're right. The CCC, the Canadian Cannabis Coalition, was founded, golly, I guess the late 1990s, early 2000s. They had their I, was 90, I think it was 98, wasn't it? Right after Something they got like back. Something like that, from, yeah. From, yeah, yeah, they had an inaugural yeah. meeting in Grand Forks. Um, yeah. You know, Br- Brian Taylor, I think, hosted that. Yeah, and, uh, he did. And, and he just won to be mayor of Grand Forks again. So well, Brian's the mayor of Grand Forks again. Yeah, it just shows that, you know, it doesn't have to be a third rail to, to be a canvas activist and a politician, at least not anymore. No. But Br- but Brian pioneered that, you know. He absolutely <laughs> but, did. And, and his community, Grand Forks, is you know, much bigger than the community I'm in. Uh, I'm in a little suburb of Victoria called Machosen. Yes. And, uh, you know, I have a log home. I've got 10 acres and, and it's a nice way to be an activist. You know, when you, when you look at the, at the field, you think to yourself, well, what can I do? What can I add to this, to this battle? And some people are meant to be frontline soldiers. And I think other people are meant to be engineers in the back, you know, building bridges and blowing up, uh, obstacles. And uh, so that's kind of what, what I've done. I've, I've been a cyber activist, helping other people more than being in the front line. And consequently, I've kind of flown under the radar. <laughs> I mean, if, you ask, if you ask the old-timers, they, they will have heard of me, but uh, I'm certainly not the most famous 
activist in well, Canada. But I know I know all the famous activists in Canada. <laughs> right. And that's what I said to my producer. I said, Matt no, Elrod, no, you don't know who because I've never heard of him. I says, Well you you will because he's been involved for many years. Like even with the drug scent drug scents and the drug policies and everything that, you know, is behind the scenes. We I know that you've been behind most of like lots of that stuff. So and, and like I said, for us that have been on that C C C list, it's a go to. Like you said, librarian, you know, have those archives that we can go back to so when somebody asks, do you have a study on this? It's like, yeah, we actually do. And you can go back and find it, right? Which has been, yeah, that, I that guess, too. you know, it's been yeah, information beneficial. sharing, expertise, referrals. Yeah. And, and yeah, we've got some pretty heavy hitters in the CCC. You know, we've got Jody Emery and um, Kurt Tusa and, of course, Deborah Harper and John Conroy. and right. Yeah, and like I said, there's like many, uh, just about anybody that's, you know, been involved in political lobbying of any kind are on that list. So, you know, it's not just the ones that are standing with the flags, too. Like, there's a lot of people that have worked policy behind the scenes that most people don't know their names. And that's why I think one thing we have to get out to the general population, too, that just because you see somebody's name in a magazine, they, they were instrumental in moving this forward, but there are thousands of people that were behind the scenes doing this too thousands of right. people writing letters and you know talking to their mps and talking to their neighbors and just moving forward with these you know changing people's minds and i think that's been more beneficial moving forward with legalization is normalizing it for our communities so that canadians say yeah can cannabis legalization is a good idea whereas you know 20 years ago they would have went oh my god are you kidding me Right, oh, but now oh sure, <laughs> no we we were in the minority for the longest time. A minority of Canadians agreed that cannabis law should be reformed, and it wasn't until there was a clear majority that uh, politicians started to feel brave enough to to talk about it. Um, you know, I, I think it's hilarious because you'll see articles now on you know how cannabis came to be legalized in Canada, and these stories usually begin around 2012. <laughs> and I have to <laughs> chuckle. And 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 who are the pioneers in the movement? And they're all these people I've never heard of in three-piece suits, <laughs> patting each other on the back. And uh, yeah, it's kind of forgotten that that there was a lot of groundwork that went into it to to gradually change uh, public perception of cannabis and and make the case. And it and it eventually filtered up from the grassroots, literally, you know to the higher echelons and, and they're all taking credit for it but right so it goes yeah, yeah well and that's a I mean, we kind of all knew that that's how it was going to go anyways right we knew yeah I, I didn't get into it for the glory anyway i, I no. got into it for the social justice you know right right and that's myself too it was like to change the law it was law reform you know, and then I found out about the medicinal benefits. And then, you know, because of my colitis, you know, learned how it would help my colitis. And, you know, but that's not how I first got involved. I wanted to see the laws change. I thought it was ridiculous that somebody should have to go to, to jail or court for a joint. You know, you see people getting busted for a roach that's not even big enough to put your thumb around. And they're going out, even sometimes now, even I'm watching live PD on a Saturday night, and they're picking through somebody's pockets to get a speck of meth just to get a test so they can charge this poor person with possession of, of math and there's not even enough like not that math's good like i'm not i'm just saying that you know it just to put the perception that this poor drug user you know which could be an addicted drug user you know is bad and here's we're going to pick this little speck of something out of his pocket that might have been there for 20 years and charge him with possession of of a controlled substance and i think over the years the perception on cannabis has changed but we need to change the perception i think on all illicit forms my that's my opinion but well, I, 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 I agree, and I, I've, it's not just cannabis activism I've been involved in. I've been trying to, in the whole drug war, I mean, you've got all the entheogenic drugs, LSD, psilocybin, there's so much medical potential, MDMA. Um, there's the, obviously the opiate overdose crisis, which is a direct consequence of, well, really the Opium Act of 1908. <laughs> Um, and, and, and yeah, you know, people forget that, especially if you live in a big city, you know, or a bubble of tolerance like Vancouver, um, you forget that, that if you do live in a smaller community or you live up north or worse, if you are, um, you know, a racialized minority, that, um, you know, they're still getting popped and, um, and arrested for possession. And, you know, I, I think back to Randy Kane, who um, went to the yeah, Supreme I Court see. after getting caught passing a joint. Well, actually, he and a friend had a, had a joint, uh, you know, in a parking lot and uh, sitting in a truck, I think, and the police approached them. And Randy, being the honorable guy he is, said, you know, officer, I cannot tell a lie. This is my joint. My friend here had nothing to do with it. And he took the rap. 
yeah. and wound up in the Supreme Court of Canada over what amounted to a roach. I know. So, so, so yeah, we, I think uh, people who are fairly new to the scene or who've enjoyed the benefit of living in a place like Vancouver probably don't realize or forget that just how, uh, how furtive we had to be, you know, how careful we had to be because it really was a war on drugs back then. Yeah, Randy was actually a guest on my show a few weeks ago, um, mm-hmm. and he's still battling, you know, like all these years yeah, later. Yeah, bless his heart. He, you know, he's still out there pushing the envelope. He's still battling with the banks, I believe, right now still, because of the fact they shut his bank accounts and such down for his hempies, novelties, and glass in uh, Kelowna. He just ran for uh, mayor in Kelowna. I'm not sure. I didn't hear how he did, though. I, I don't didn't see anything recently so probably unfortunately he didn't get in which is unfortunate but I mean just putting yourself out there um for any civil council you know mayor whatever that takes a lot of guts so sure, you, you know, know Ted Smith uh, ran his for Victoria council in the last uh, election and uh, uh, he did well he placed in you know, the middle of a very large pack but, I know um, but you know you usually don't get elected on your first crack at it you need to get your name out there and really be recognized and Absolutely. And, and like I said, Ted, anybody that actually put their themselves out there, Brittany as well, but she won in Nelson. Um, Brian, who won in Grand Forks as well, which is huge because, I mean, he was mayor prior, but now having him back in because Teresa's had a bit of issues out there with, you know, being able to run a store and the, the city council they had in were not so cannabis friendly anymore. And that's not Grand Forks. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It was just mm-hmm. kind of like odd. But now I mean, hopefully that that will change back to the way it should be. And you know what I mean? But just putting yourself out there, um, that takes a lot. And it's the money that it, it costs as well, and just to be out there. So that's something that a lot of people have done over the years, is try to get into the political end of things and change things that way, which is, you know, a great way of doing it. Well, yeah, so, I would say, you know, all, all politics is local, and it's true that uh, you really do have to start from the grassroots. And, um, yeah, if you can't beat them, join them. Right, exactly. <laughs> take, take over. <laughs> right? And like I said, if you, even with the licensed producers, everybody's like, oh, you're going to go work for them? Well, if you can work for them, at least then you're, you know, giving them the information that they might not know. Not that I'm going to run out and go start working for one, but, you know, the ones that have gone to work for them, at least have got some inside information, so you've got to get them from the inside. Now, that being said, too, um, you just had a little bit of a go-around with your local council. What was that all about? Uh, well, what happened was um, last October 6th, uh, I watched a video of an all-candidates meeting here in Machosen, and to my shock and dismay, I discovered that they had a bylaw on the books that they were going to um, pass on the 15th, two days before cannabis was to be legal, that would ban um, any retail outlets in the district and ban the four personal plants that you could grow and uh, also um, banned the building of concrete bunkers on ALR land. And, uh, yeah, I, I was really surprised because Machosen had historically been pretty progressive. We had a councillor named uh, Morley Milne who'd advanced a resolution to the, um, uh, the, the BC Union of Municipalities calling for cannabis legalization or at least the study of it and immediate decrim. So, you know, I'd been proud of that and proud that Machosen had been, um, you know, a leading community in Canada on the subject. And I, I, I was completely blindsided. I did not expect this at all. Um, and so my first thought was, okay, someone needs to walk the plank, you know. Um, and I blame myself, too, for not, for not seeing it, it, it coming. In my defense, I had pretty short notice. I, I learned that uh, last July, uh, the council had finally gotten around to thinking about cannabis policy. And they hadn't given themselves nearly enough time to look at what other neighboring uh, districts were doing and and what provincial and federal legislation allowed them to do and what it covered. And and so in a bit of a panic, they decided, well, let's just ban everything and then let the incoming council sort it out. Right. And once I learned that, that that was what they were going to do, I thought, okay, well, this isn't quite so bad. But, um, yeah, when I first learned about it, I, I posted a long screed on the Machosen Facebook group and said, well, I'm, I'm thinking this council has probably never heard of the Allard ruling and, you know, pointed out to them that in Allard, the courts decided that even medical grows of a dozen or 
or more plants, dozens of plants, don't pose a particular risk that you can't cope with. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that really growing cannabis is like growing tomatoes. And so I pointed this all out to them. And ultimately, I went down to a hearing at City Hall and and I gave a 22-minute dissertation, <laughs> boring everybody in the room to tears. But but thanks to my post to Facebook, we had a full house of Machosanites who were up in arms, also surprised and also dismayed because they were all looking forward to to having their four plant allowance. And uh, and it's so stupid because Machosan is a farming community. I, as I mentioned earlier, I have 10 acres, and you know, minimum lot size around here is I think two, but on average maybe five. And, yeah, so uh, it's not like you're downtown Cranbrook like I am. Yeah, and I was, you know, I was reading about all these condo developers and stratas and apartments saying, "Oh, we're not going to allow you to grow your four plants." And I was kind of smugly thinking to myself, "Ha ha, you know, I've got 10 acres. Uh, I'll never have to worry about it." So yeah. it, it it was all the more shocking, right, that uh that my chosen of all places should want to do this. So I gave this yeah, 22-minute dissertation to the council and the assembled and laid it all down. I laid down the history of cannabis prohibition and I started in 2012. <laughs> had I had I gone right back to the beginning, I would have really bored them to tears. But, <laughs> you know, t- talking about how, how much warning they had from the time that uh, that resolution came out, out of Machosan, I wanted to remind them that Machosan had called for legalization. And then I went to 2013 when Trudeau announced it as a campaign promise and on through you know, the task force and so on. And and I basically just wanted to shame the council and say, you know, you guys really dropped the ball on this. You're asleep at the switch and you need to fix this. Unfortunately, they backed themselves into a corner. And and there was and there is community support to ban those concrete bunkers in our beautiful rural community. And because they bundled it in this one omnibus bill, they really had no choice but to pass all three prohibitions. But I did get a solemn oath out of I think all of them and all the candidates that they would turn their attention right back to it and and probably lift the four plant, uh, plant ban. They were flirting with okay. the idea of just just banning indoor, but you know it gets Kafkaesque when you when you start telling people how they may grow four plants. Right, exactly. On that note, Matt, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll come back to that afterward because that's something that I, I'd like to talk about more is the four plant count and what your opinion is on that as well. So we'll be right back after a quick break. I'd like to thank my All sponsors right. who are 12 High Chicks Magazine, Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partner Society, the Haley Rose Foundation, and Mom, the Mayor Retire Mayor's United for Medical Marijuana. Our song is going to be Something Reggae by Al, or whatever Al picks. <laughs> we'll be right back. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. <laughs>
maybe now I'm back with Matthew Elrod. <laughs> so we were talking a little bit before about, you know, how things are changing and, and where we think legalization is going and this battle with the four plants. And do you really believe that four plants is enough? Well, I, I think it would be for some. Um, and of course, there, there's a wide variability between how much um, you know, yield you can get out of four plants. Um, I remember when they first floated that idea, and I was thinking of Valerie Corral at the WAM, you know, um, dispensary, uh, or, or I should say Compassion Club Collective down in California, and they would just stake their plants down to the ground. You know, so from a single root system, they could have a hedge and their sea of green, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, so if, you, if you know what you're doing, you can get a, a fair yield out of four plants. That said, it seemed to me they should have made it four plants in flower so that, you know, you could have a whole bunch of young clones coming up. And, or what if you're going from seed and you haven't sexed them yet? Um, yeah. And then there's always calamities, you know, acts of God you don't count on, like a spider mite infestation or something else going horribly wrong. And with only four plants, that doesn't, it's not very redundant. Let's put it that way. Well, it's almost like somebody dropped the ball when they were educating the government on growing cannabis. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, they were looking for all these... Um, consultations and finding out why who what and it's almost like somebody didn't explain to them you need a mother you know so you can have clones seeds take a year you know not quite a year but from you know ground pudding sprouting six months you know mostly to get it into a nice veg with a seed and then another you know 12 well 10 yeah, six, you want to you want to have some in vegetation and some in flower at right. the same time so you've got a constant output and yeah um yeah, and the thing is, the task force did actually consult with a lot of people. I don't know if they consulted with the master growers, but they looked at what the U.S. states that have legalized have done and their um, plant uh, quotas, and which are also really low. Um, and I think they just kind of picked a number out of thin air. And at, at the same time, they said, "Oh, and it can't be more than a meter high." Which right. Was another they've taken that they, out. Yeah. Yeah, and they pulled that out of thin air too. I yeah. think. Yeah, but they've also taken that out of the regulations now. It doesn't, Finally, doesn't yeah, I, they got talked yeah. out of that one. Yeah, thank God. I mean, really, what, what are you going to do? Like, I, I made a comment before, like, what are the cops going to do, run around with a meter stick on their pants now? Like, yeah, tape measures, <laughs> tape measures and right? scales. <laughs> right, like, just ridiculousness. No, that is so ridiculous. And I mean, some of it still is a bit ridiculous. But, you know, well, that the, being the more said, you think about, about regulating cannabis, the sillier it becomes. Because, yeah, you start you know, o o micromanaging and over-regulating. And the more you do that, and then you step back and you look at, well, how are we handling alcohol and how are we handling all these other things? And and um, it's not nearly so fine-grained. So it, it's just uh, an overwhelming urge, I think, on the part of bureaucrats to write legislation and, and make it complicated. And then over the public health officials are all saying, you know, well, we we want a public health-focused approach, you know, and they get they go overboard. Of course, and, and what kills me is they don't. They say, oh, we don't have any studies. Now we can readily study this plant. You've had studies for decades. that You've just been, you know, hiding underneath the sheets because you didn't want anybody to know that you actually did know that there was no harms in this, you know, in this substance. I think it was, what, what year was that, 2010? I think it was when the conservatives came out and said they were doing a study on harms of cannabis. And then when they couldn't find any, they stopped the study. Do you remember hearing? <laughs> That's you know, that's happened more than once. And and in yeah. fact, while it's true, I think it's fair to say that prohibition has interfered with research intended to find benefits, it, it hasn't at all interfered with research in intended to find harms and to sort of retroactively justify prohibition and say, oh, look, see, we were right. Um, but, you know, what harms they do find, again, if you step back and you look at it in context, cannabis is still relatively harmless and as the supreme court put it remarkably benign and uh you know so you, you really have to have to look very closely in that earlier that case i mentioned randy kane's supreme court challenge he went in with chris clay out of london ontario mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh david malmo levine out of vancouver the three of them right. <laughs> found themselves that. before the supreme court and the supreme court just had to do legal acrobatics to maintain prohibition at the end of the day, they said, okay, prohibition doesn't make any sense and it doesn't work, but the government still has a right it's to obligated. do it. It's obligated. Yeah, it's still obligated. And, and, the, and the, reason they, the reason they said they have a right is because cannabis may 
or there's, how they put it, there's a reasonable apprehension of harm to a subset of Canadians, namely adolescents, expectant women, and uh, people with mental health uh, histories and disorders. And based on that, uh, they had a right to prohibit it for everyone. But if you if you put the bar that low, then you know the government could prohibit hamburger or or you know uh, junk food, sugar, or sugar, yeah, you sugar. name it, right? Because right. you know if, if if some people who use it in excess might have some harm, that that's that's uh, that's really quite a crazy. Well, standard. anything in excess can be harmful. Like I mean, that's what I mean. Like, what's the level of harm? Because anything in, in over excess is harmful. So you know, to to, like, a, except- to, uh, to some people, right? I mean, to some vulnerable right. group. And and if your standard is well, this could be harmful to a four year old if they did a whole bunch of it. Well, yeah, <laughs> but uh, but then it, you know, an attack I started taking many years ago. I realized, well, we're, this is getting us nowhere. We're arguing over how harmful cannabis is or isn't, but we're missing sort of an implicit argument that prohibitionists make, and that is that if we can prove it's really harmful, then arresting people for it makes sense. And it's that second move which they never really had to make, you know, because they got us stalled on how harmful it is um, that I wanted to move on to. And, and so I started saying, okay, let's, let's imagine that cannabis is as addictive as nicotine, as impairing as alcohol, as habit forming as Facebook. <laughs> um, uh, does it, you know, why then does it make sense to give control over it to organized crime and teenagers? And, um, you know, we've got more control over cat food than we have over the controlled drugs and substances. Mm-hmm. And um, and I think ultimately what happened was Kelly Coulter of, of Normal Women Canada mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. got an audience with Trudeau and, and made mm-hmm. that case to him. Not not the cannabis is great argument, not the pro pod argument, but the No, it was it was exactly what you but said. But the public health the argument. Public health argument. Because I wasn't I wasn't in the room with her that day. Andrea was actually with her that day because um, she didn't do that just by herself there was a whole group of us that were pushing towards that end of it right but that's exactly how we kind of went at it and and at some point of it it was good some portions of it i want to cut my tongue out for because of the whole save the children portion of it that was kind of shoved down their throat but yeah it was it was instrumental to getting that change instrumental for sure yeah i mean and 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 basically any politician i i had long anticipated that any politician who was paying attention could do that. He could come out and make a case for cannabis law reform, not based on cannabis being benign or great or, or you know, the uh, that everybody should tune, on, tune in, turn on, and drop out, but rather that if you think cannabis is harmful, the best way to deal with that is is a regulated model. Yeah. And, um, and so that's what Trudeau did. And I think other politicians are starting to sort of pick up on that. And, they're, and hopefully... Canada will serve as sort of a beacon. I mean, what we've done is, is as we were saying earlier, it's way over-regulated, and um, they're treating it like enriched uranium. But I think it is a good first step. And, and as they see the sky doesn't fall and that they realize that they have over-regulated, maybe those regulations will relax. Well, I think, and, they're, a little uh, bit in, I think they're a little bit taken back by the volume of cannabis that's been sold in Canada over the last week. Like they didn't figure, I think they were going to run out as quickly as they have. And mm-hmm. the volume, you know, like the volumes that have been being bought, like it's, I'm, I'm not shocked, but in a way I kind of am. I didn't, we, I mean, we knew that the majority of Canadians smoked cannabis. I didn't really realize there was that, that vast, you know what I mean? Well, well, I think For, there's been a bit, I, I read I, in one article that there's been a bit of a fall off. And I think, you know, there was that initial surge was just the novelty of it to be, you know, one of the people to, to first buy legal weed in Canada. Um, and, and I expect that'll happen. And, and the other thing is, is there's still a huge gray market and there's still a huge black market. And it'll be a while until that gets displaced and it'll never be entirely displaced, let's face it. Well, if they had, <laughs> but, yeah, if they had stores in every place, like there's no store here. I'm sure there's mm-hmm. no store. Well, you're, you're close to Victoria. I'm not sure what the, but Kamloops is the only legal store in bc right now in so how province. is everything right yeah. so how are you supposed to get there i'll just take you know 12 hours out of my day to drive to go get a couple of doobies like it just seems ridiculous right and i mean if they would have been i can't say they can't say they, they can't say they weren't prepared this has been in the rollout for two years 
how can they tell, you know, keep saying, oh, we weren't ready for it? That's another you question know, I just want to know. Yeah, it's been said by many that, oh, we've rushed into this. And the conservatives, of course, are saying that Trudeau rushed into this and he didn't consider this and he didn't consider that. But again, for those of us who've been around for a couple of decades looking at this very slow evolution, um, I mean, you can go back to 2002 to the Senate committee report that recommended legalization. Eight volumes. I think there was, uh, you know, about 800 pages all was, told in that, yeah, it was in four, that report. Yeah, four pieces to that. Yeah, because I think I yeah, had and, it and then somewhere. They laid it all down, you know, in great detail about why cannabis should be legal and how to go about it. And um, and further, they had the precedence of alcohol and tobacco and, and other products they've regulated. So it it was as though they were reinventing the wheel and they really didn't need to. And and so, yeah, Machosen wasn't the only place caught with their pants down um, you know, all the provinces were kind of slow. Even Ontario, right, just recently, well, with the Ford election, uh, decided to completely switch gears and go from I know. Cr- crown to private, uh, setting right. back. So. Yeah, absolutely, which, you know, does set everything back because nobody was prepared for that aspect of things, right? I mean, mm-hmm. here, um, our city council has gone ahead and set, you know, precedent already because we have Dicar Pharmaceuticals that came in four years ago. Um, so we have a licensed production site in the process of being built. It's still not done. They're still not under production as far as I know. And this is four years. I've been here four years now, and they started four years ago. So in reality, we don't have a store here. There's The stores that were in Kimberley um, are running. I'm not sure if they're still open. Even actually, I heard rumor yesterday that they both shut down. Um, Nelson had eight. I think they're down to four and they might have closed their doors now too. I'm not even sure because people are, you know, like they need to get the cannabis. But then in the insight, they also know that if they stay open, they're not going to get their licensing. So and it's difficult to get a license in British Columbia. Like it's not as easy like of all places. Like British Columbia should have been the easiest place to roll this out. We've been doing this for 70 years out here. Right. Alberta's yeah, well- been forefronted. Well, that was another dumb thing about the Machosen bylaws. You know, the, their main objective is stopping the concrete bunkers. The red tape involved in opening a concrete bunker is horrendous, and and we've been exposed to that risk for for years. And and nobody's ever even applied for a permit because yeah, it, it's extremely daunting in terms of the dispensaries or or retail outlets here in BC. The federal or the provincial government told the municipalities. Um, you've got final say. We're not going to grant a license in your district unless you write a glowing letter of recommendation for the for the outlet. And what's more, you've got an obligation to consult with all the neighboring businesses and residences um, and make sure they're on board with it. So, you know, uh, yeah, opening a dispensary is 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 a real challenge. Um, mm-hmm. You know, financially as well as all the, all the red tape and the bureaucracy you have to find exactly. Your way through. Well, exactly. Like, it's not even like it's not even the seventy five hundred dollar non refundable application fee. It's you know getting, and I mean, city council here is going to allow up to ten stores. They said, which four in the downtown core, and then six out on the on the highway type because we have a strip that runs the highway three runs through town. So they were going to allow six out that way, and then four in the downtown core. Eventually, like they've already kind of you know precedently put that into bylaw. You know, you can smoke where you can smoke tobacco, but not walking down the street, not in a park. And, you know, just general. So even Cranbrook has done that much already, which I will say, it's okay. I'm not, you know, what can you do? I, at least they didn't say we can't grow our can't grow our four plants. So. Yep. No, I, I it's, uh, it, I, you know, the municipalities really don't have to do much because the province is, have taken care of a lot, and the provinces don't have to do much because the fed, feds have been so tight-fisted about it. And and w- once you get down to the municipal level, there's so many laws and regulations in the three levels of government that uh, it, it's it's quite strangling, really. Totally, and they, and that, like I said, just even having the fact that the only store in British Columbia is actually owned by Liquor Control Board. It's not somebody that privately went in and tried to open their own store either. It's all uh, union employees that have pr- probably, I'm not going to say for sure because I don't know, have probably worked in a liquor-controlled substance 
uh, facility, right? Because we have a BC liquor store here still. We have two that are private, and then we have, uh, or three, I guess, that are private, and then one that's still a BC liquor board. And uh, I don't know how, because I know that it's got to be all done through the liquor control. So, mm-hmm. I, I, like I said, as far as I know, nobody here um, has applied to the city to even attempt to open one yet because of the cost right. and because of the liquor control and everything else. I was told that somebody was going to attempt to, but the cost, again, at $7,500 non-refundable isn't something you just want to throw away, right? Unless you've got more money than brains, I guess. Yeah, or, or in the case of the bunkers, you actually have to build your bunker and have it inspected by Health Canada and approved before you can even apply for a license to put your cannabis plants in it. And oh, wow. there's no guarantee, no guarantee you're going to be approved, and, uh, and it can take up to a year uh, to get that license, all told. So you've got to have a lot of startup capital and, and be mm-hmm. able to make, you know, be prepared not to make a dime for a couple of years after you've started. And uh, right. that's, that's, that's just a barrier that most people can't get over. Certainly no, the gray market independent- dispensaries. Right, and, and unless you're independently wealthy, and I don't know many of our friends that are, like even our yeah, lawyer well, friends, don't have disposable cash like that. Like that's pretty much disposable cash that's got to be tied up in some other you know thing for two years, and there's a chance of you losing it all. So it's kind of like playing the stock market, almost like Russian roulette. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's something that you know. I, I guess I was naive, um, and a lot of activists probably were, in thinking, well, legalization. We we we, I'm I'm kind of reminded of when my big brother taught me to play chess, and I I eventually got to be really good defensively, <laughs> but I always <laughs> lost. And, but when yeah. I finally got so good defensively that I got the prerogative and I got the upper hand, and it was my turn to go on the attack, I didn't know what to do because I'd never done it before. Right. And in the case of ca- cannabis legalization, we we're so used to being on the back foot, you know, fighting. For, for legalization that I don't know that a lot of activists gave much thought into what it would look like in a post-legalization world. And, and, and what the hell we're going to do with ourselves? <laughs> That's uh, what I'm at. How am I going to do well, with myself? On that well, note, happily, a, again, there are lots of drugs that are still prohibited and, and, and the, the, you know, the war against the war on drugs, um, there's still battles to be won. Some, Absolutely. Someone, and on that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll come back and talk about the fact that opioids and what it's done to our communities and how we need to work at getting everything regulated. We'll be right back after a quick break. I'd like again to thank my sponsors who are 12 High Chicks Magazine, Haley Rose Foundation, Maritime Regenerative for Medical Marijuana, and the Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partners Society. We're going to have some more songs from Vintage Reggae Cafe Volume 1. We'll be right back. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. back with Matt and we were talking a little bit before the break about I can't even remember 
that's pot summers for you, <laughs> um, dispensaries. And, you know, the cost of, of what uh, they, they, you know, and just the weight and having to get there. And like you said, how naive a lot of us are because it's like we've got this, but then, like you said, there's so many other beneficial, beneficial, you know, drugs out there. And if you, and I've always maintained, if you use everything in moderation as an adult, you should be able to do that. Yeah, and, and as with cannabis, you know, as I was saying earlier, even if you d- identify that there are problems with certain drugs, um, outlawing them just makes matters worse. And uh, you're better off, you know, pulling them back into the mainstream and out of a deviant side stream where they're unregulated and, and uh, unwatched. You know, and prohibition kind of drives a wedge between doctors, patients, parents and their kids, teachers and students, cops and their community. and uh, And it also impedes the evolution of social customs and mores that that uh, really govern or, or prevent problematic use from you know happening you prevent responsible use from becoming problematic you know you can demonstrate to your kids how to drink a glass of wine with dinner responsibly but you do that with a joint at least until recently they could take your kids away and, and as a consequence uh, yeah the, the normal social controls that, that we have around drug use that go back hundreds or thousands of years Aren't uh, aren't able to take take hold. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it's the old taboo, right? <clears throat> you know, don't you know, monkey see, monkey do, or you know, do as I say and not as I do. When your kids are watching you drink beer, you know, it's the same almost as coffee, though. You know, if you look at the you know the whole sense of it, kids drink coffee because we do. It's almost like you know. So if you don't hide and make it a taboo, it doesn't make it so appealing you know yeah well it's the forbidden fruit phenomenon right uh you know if you want to get teenagers uh, to do something tell them they shouldn't do it but (laughs) but but there's also uh you know as you say a demonstration and and um you know the kids kids watch you make coffee and they watch you have a glass of wine with with dinner and and they see okay this is how these things are done responsibly and and these things are for adults yeah. And, uh, yeah, sure. absolutely. Right back. Okay, I wanted to say something specifically because I went through this as a child. My mom got so scared when she found out that I was drinking and experimenting in my teens that she just stopped me in my tracks and said, Alan, I know that you're going to go out and experiment and party and stuff like that, but please do it at home so I know you're safe. That way she knew I was get what I was getting into and she could be there if there was an issue, right? I wish more mm-hmm. parents were like that now and they're not. So I just, I had to say that. No, oh, it's yeah, true. No, no, there was, and it, go ahead. There, there, was a, there was always like, you know, one, one kid, one kid in your, in your social circle had hip parents and they, and those hip parents would allow the kids to come over and have a beer or have a toke inside under supervision. And, of course, all the other parents, if they found out about it, would have been up in right, arms. Exactly. Yeah. And, and growing yeah. up in the 60s and 70s when it was free love and party and all that crap. Um, I you remember know, my mom bitching and complaining I, about my here kids. Here I am doing the same the thing, partying every weekend with my friends, yeah. getting high and watching movies. But I'm not in jail, well, like, am I? Yeah, exactly. And like I said, that's like my mom. Like My mom raised my older three kids. It's not a secret. I came out of a domestic you know, bad relationship, and my mom raised my three kids, and she would complain that they're smoking pot in the house and drinking, and all their yeah. friends are there. And I'd say, but at least you'd know where they are. They're not at somebody else's house in somebody else's basement, ODing or, or you know, having alcohol Exactly, poisoning. and my they're mom would basement. my mom would come downstairs because she built me a little, you know, teenager unit down in the basement, and she would come downstairs at two o'clock in the morning and knock on the door and say, Alan, it's time to go to bed. You and your friends... And he got school in the morning instead of saying, I can smell beer and I know you're smoking weed. It was just, it's time to go to bed, guys. You know? Yeah. 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 It didn't didn't always work out that way, but you know. (laughs) Anyways, I'll let you guys get back to your conversation. (laughs) But it's true, though. Like, it's it's the whole taboo. And I think, you know, now that we have the opportunity that we do have legalization here, we maybe teach our children that there's no taboo. You know, it's a, it's a different world now that, you know, at least, like I said, I'm not pleased about all the, you know, regulations that are attached to it. But, you know, we were at a global marijuana march, you know, a few years back. And if we would have been caught passing a joint, per se, not that they would have prosecuted, but they could have for trafficking. 
right? Like you said, mm-hmm. with Randy Kane, right? Now we can go to this and we can pass that joint and not worry about getting busted for trafficking. Yeah, yeah. And Mark Emery actually I think, spent a few months behind bars for passing a joint. Yeah. Because tra- trafficking is defined as, as either gifting or, and in fact, if you find yourself in a circle of friends, you know, back in the day, it's weird to think that we're post legalization, but back in the day, if you were in a circle of friends at a party and you didn't even partake and you just passed the joint along, that was that was trafficking. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, like as much as, you know, not all great positive things that come along with this new legislation, there are some positive things, like I said, even though, you know, whoever that fellow was that got, you know, the ticket for $672 or whatever it was because his cannabis was within reach while he was driving. Uh, A week before, you would have been pulled out of that car, probably charged with possession or maybe even trafficking, depending on how much was in that bag. You would have been hauled down to the police station in handcuffs, kept for at least four to 12 hours. You know what I mean? Let go on a promise to appear or depending on your past criminal record. It would have been nothing but a rigmarole. This way, at least, you know, maybe they didn't even take his cannabis. They put him put it in his trunk and wrote him a ticket and off he went. So... Yeah, it'll that, take a while, yeah. I think, for, for Canadians to to get a hang of what they're allowed to do and what they're not, um, you know, including having cannabis within reach in your car. And and that, you know, so, some of the rules almost make sense, or at least they're on par with alcohol. And right. at the end of the day, equality with alcohol would be a nice beginning. I know there's some who would call for an equality with coffee, and uh, and a case could be made for that. But, hey, first things first, we are the first G7 nation to do anything like this. Um, we're we're so close to the United States socially, uh, you know, demographically, economically, that we're before the the Americans could say, well, okay, sure, the Dutch have their coffee shops, but they're totally different than us, and yeah. and and we can't really learn anything from the Dutch. But when Canada legalizes, it's going to be very difficult for the U.S. to to you know say the sky keep is turning up well exactly keep turning a blind eye to to the reality and the truth that you know this is a safer st- substance than alcohol and within the first week like i said you, you've already seen you know the the repercussions of a few odd ducks and it's not like there's been hundreds of people getting ticketed you know or thrown in jail because i know there's predictions of the first week you know thousands of people would be arrested and da 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 and that's not the case either so again the sky has not fallen yeah, I don't know how much of an appetite the police have uh, to enforce petty cannabis law, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, well, and, 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 the, and they'll probably be, as before, enforced disproportionately against visible minorities and First Nations. And Well, I think uh, they've got relief. It frees them up to do with their job, you know, other things. So if nothing else, maybe they're feeling a bit of relief. That they don't have to worry about chasing after a bunch of teenagers for pot anymore. You know? Yeah, and, and a lot of these laws are complaint-driven. So what happens is somebody says, oh, look, you know, officer, I see some kids over there smoking a joint, and the cop has to roll his eyes and act because, you know, a citizen has put him to it. Or yeah. for that matter, when the press comes out, I remember when the Decline Cafe opened in, uh, in Vancouver, and they operated for, I don't know, a year, <laughs> you know, with people as, as a vapor lounge. And mm-hmm. then they made international press, and the police rolled in with their SWAT teams and shut them down mm-hmm. because it was mm-hmm. it was an embarrassment. So, it's it, these laws are often complaint driven, and yeah, um, and that that's maybe another reason they're enforced disproportionately. Well, did you see the uh, Twitter uh, post from the Toronto City Police saying smoking cannabis is not against law? Now, if you see somebody smoking pot, do not call nine one one. Yeah, yeah, stop calling it. <laughs> so quit calling nine one one. It's not an emergency anymore. It's legal. Get it through your heads. So maybe that would be a deterrent to you know maybe people are finally gonna gonna get it. Like I said, within you know I, f- I figure within about five years things would would have waxed. The craft growing will be, you know, a little more available. That we'll have maybe the ability to bring our wares to market. I mean, I've got great hope, right? But when I think yeah. back to where we were five years ago, and I can I hear Kelly Coulter in my head saying, "Just think of where we're going to be in five years. Just keep thinking where we're going to be in five years. And in five mm-hmm. years, is any of this going to matter? So, in five years from that time, we are sitting here with a legal legislation. Some are very, you know, not so happy with. Some are, you know, okay with it." It is a first step, and I don't know, like I said, it makes me not have to worry so much about passing that doobie, you know, even though I'm a patient. Even as a patient, I had to worry about passing that joint. So, you know, that didn't oh, yeah, give for, us... I mean, for, Chris, it's, for consumers, it's it's definitely great. I mean, if you're, if you're in the business, then you've got things to worry about and things to gripe about. But, 
that for consumers there's very little to complain about. I mean, 30 grams is, you know, that's a that's a fairly large oh, bag uh, to have yeah. in public. You can have more privately at home. For plants, yeah, for most consumers. I mean, let's face it, um, you know, the vast majority of cannabis consumers are moderate, you know, weekend, occasional consumers. They're not hardcore. They're not daily. So, yeah. you know, for those people, and, and in particular, I'm thinking about people like senior citizen, um, people who might be more inclined to obey the law to not, you know, or would, would much rather be within the law. That's the only law they've ever broken. And, and now they can say, well, now I'm completely law abiding. That's a nice thing to be able to say. Well, and as well, and, too, with the pay, people that couldn't get doctor signatures or didn't have the cash to pay, you know, three or hundred or plus dollars to get a signature for a doctor now have the ability and access to be able to go. I mean, you can't go into the stores and ask, hey, is this okay for my fibromyalgia? But that's easy enough to Google and find out what strains best for what and then go into the store and purchase it, which gives well, that, pay, that, people that... Yeah. You know, people without, yeah. you know, the opportunity for signatures to actually get access to self-medicaid now. Well, that's absolutely huge. I mean, obviously, yeah. the medical marijuana program has been so dysfunctional and unconstitutional that only a fraction of patients who'd like to be on it are actually on it. And you've got the doctors that are hard to find, a sympathetic doctor or a knowledgeable doctor. So there'll be a lot of people who would have liked to have used cannabis medicinally that now will be able to, and stigma-free, as, as you point out. Right. And something you mentioned before the break, you know, is, Cannabis is a substitute for alcohol and opiates. And um, so I expect that at the end of the day, on balance, it's going to be a public health benefit if, if more people start consuming. There's no reason to assume that will happen, but if more people start consuming cannabis, we can expect drinking to go down and opiate overdoses to go down and the use of pharmaceuticals to go down. And um, you know, So at the end of the day, it's, a, it's actually a, a public health benefit. Totally. And like you said, there's so many people now that will be able to access that couldn't before or they were accessing but worried about the legalities. And, you know, that's something that I tell people with the paranoia that goes along with with cannabis. I said it's a stigma. It's because now that it's got no stigma, you'll notice that side effect maybe dissipate because you're not worried about <clears throat> what your neighbor, <clears throat> excuse me, what your neighbor thinks anymore. Or if your neighbor's mm-hmm. seeing you, or if your neighbor knows, you know what I mean? So that paranoia side effect should be, you know, hopefully eliminated. So that's one... Yeah, yeah you just know, the, the, the harms of the stress alone <laughs> that right? that was causing on the public right. health system. Right, like people are worried about, you know, what their neighbor thought, and are their children are going to be taken away, or how many children were taken away because of their parents smoking cannabis, you know, and the stress on a family, that's been eliminated. So, you know what I'm saying, there are, there are some positive things to this legislation, as many positive almost as there is negative. Oh, yeah, and, and there's the generation gap too. I mean, my parents couldn't relate. They were hipper than most, but nonetheless, they would never partake in a million years. And then it turned out in my dad's final days that he, or in his final years, he started using uh, or taking cannabis cookies to help with glaucoma and sleep, and he, he, he loved it. Um, mm-hmm. But but you know as Al was saying you know in our teenage years uh, it created for most people for most kids a big generation gap if you weren't lucky to have a hip parent then it was something you couldn't talk to them about and it and uh, it just divided society so but yeah I, I I'm also hopeful that as the stigma decreases uh, and it becomes normalized you now for the prohibitionists the word normalized is is bad <laughs> but uh, for anybody who looks at it objectively. Um, the more normalization, the better. Absolutely. And that's exactly what we all kind of fought for. It's not freedom, not quite yet, but the, the stigma to be gone so that we can actually be seen just as we are. Normal, tax-paying mm-hmm. citizens at work that have jobs, families, that we go about our daily lives just like everybody else. We just, you know, we consume cannabis. That's, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> equal, equal rights, again, you know, it's just equal rights. Right. With people who prefer their coffee or their Xanax or their alcohol. Um, you know, I like to think about it this way, in a, in a libertarian way. I don't mind if my neighbor smokes weed or grows weed. It, it really me- it doesn't matter to me at all. You know, I might have an issue if he tries to sell it to my preschoolers, but, um, yeah. but then, I'll go, then I'll go talk to him about it. <laughs> you know, I'm not going right. to call the cops. Right. But I mean, in, in in reality, I think that we have to give, you know, adults credit that they wouldn't be doing that. You know what I mean? That they were, that we're not that um, irresponsible that somebody would be trying mm-hmm. to sell a preschooler joints. I think as Canadian adults, I think we're smarter than that. I don't think our government's given 
us enough credit to know what we can and can't consume within limits with these silly, you know, driving impairment laws. But, you know, as Canadians, I think we are intelligent. I think many of us that do smoke cannabis take the time to research. Even the younger generation, I see them, you know, talking and they and they know what cannabis strains are and, they, and they're finding out what medicinal purposes it has. So even our younger generation, the millennials, are learning about cannabis in, as a plant rather than just to get high. And mm -hmm. I think they're seeing it as, you know, geez, I'm a bit stressed out. This is better than taking this Ritalin my mom's had me on. You know, and I think they're asking questions about pharmaceuticals, and I think that's a good thing, too. Yeah, there was a gal who stood at uh, Parliament Hill, uh, what was that, last month, mm -hmm. uh, and launched, launched a campaign saying, look, I've gotten off all of these antidepressants they'd put me on, and I'm using cannabis, and I'm standing up, and I'm proud of it. And uh, bless your heart, that was, that was yeah. a nice thing to see. Because, yeah, you know, absolutely. all those all those antidepressants and SSRIs, Prozac, Paxil, they never even tested those on teens. They would just prescribe them to them off-label. And uh, hundreds of thousands of Canadians have been put on those antidepressants. And it turns out that they can cause suicidal ideation and all sorts of nasty side effects. They're difficult to get off. And yet, uh, yeah, the medical community doesn't, bat an eye at that you know and, right. and most parents don't it's, right. it's really a matter of context and if all you do is look at cannabis in isolation then you can make it seem like a real scary thing but if you step back and you look at it in the big picture you realize oh okay this is actually an extremely benign herb <laughs> and uh right. and the least of our worries absolutely well, i know that uh, noah kirkman was uh, Lisa's son actually, you know, mm -hmm. got off a lot of his pharmaceuticals using cannabis and was one of the first teens that was able to use his cannabis in high school in Calgary, Alberta, of all places. So, you know, with having people like Lisa and her son Noah and Geneva with her daughter in, in Ottawa there, Cheryl right, with right. Haley, you know, with, uh, with, you know, Sarah with Maya, um, Mandy with, you know, with Liam, that's bringing forward the, the addition to what benefits cannabis has for children. And that's a different mm -hmm. show, so we're going to wrap ourselves up. <laughs> I think that thank you for coming on, Matt. We could probably go on for another three hours. <laughs> but, time flies. It sure does. Again, I'd like to thank you for coming on. We'll have to have you on again. So we will thank my sponsors, who are 12 High Chicks Magazine, Canadian Therapeutic Cannabis Partners, Mom of the Maritimers United for Medical Marijuana, and the Haley Rose Foundation. And next week, we're going to try and get Teresa Taylor and her dad on the show. We'll talk to you then. You take care. So what are you doing? Nothing. Nothing? Why not? I'm trying to get on this lifestyle radio website. Sounds like a cool website. Yeah, it's all right. Oh, wait, I might have it. You might have it. You're listening to Lifestyle Radio. The opinions expressed during this show are those of the individual participants and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of their associated organizations or Lifestyle Radio.